here to make a nice cup of tea at Mount Everest. Whoa! How did a football match start a war? And how far can a frog jump? make a ruler longer than it is. Carol, even you cannot make something longer than it is because but, mm, that's as long as it's ever yeah, been. In, in my book, something as long as it is, it is. <laughs> we are okay. agreed then. All so right, much. now here I have two balancing points yes. and the distance between them is longer than the ruler. Than the ruler. Yeah. So if I can build a bridge with this ruler between mm -hmm. these two points, I will have effectively made this ruler longer than it is. If yes. you could do that. All right. I shall introduce another bottle here. Mm. The distance between these two is still longer, longer than it yes. is. Yes. Mm. Second ruler. Third ruler, the distance between here. Still longer. Okay. Still cannot be done. It not, still can't no, be done. Not without glue and string. Indeed, and... it can be done without the aid of anything else. You simply overlap the rulers like so, making a triangular structure. Place the ends on the ends of the lemonade bottles. And there you have your bridge. A making clever. the ruler longer than it is. A clever little how, but with one basic weakness. A bridge is supposed to support things, it heavy is. things. This bridge will. This is a very heavy tin of it beans. It is a heavy tin of beans. It's very Far heavy. too heavy for that little Even structure. though these rulers are extremely flexible and pliable, this no, bridge no, will no, take no, the no, weight no, no. of the beans. There we have it. Oh. That is how you make each ruler longer and very effective than they are. How do you make a nice cup of tea up Mount Everest? You know how to make tea down here on the ground. It's easy. You boil up a kettle till your water's 100 degrees centigrade, add it to your tea bags or your tea, let it brew for a minute or two. When it is brewed, pour it out and enjoy a nice cup of tea. There you go, Fred. Cup of tea Very for nice. you. Thank you so much. And some cakes, Thank Carol. You. Yeah. Cup of tea oh, nice for you cake. as well. You but you did say a cup of tea stone. up Everest. I mean, it's the same thing, isn't it? Ah, not necessarily so, because making a cup of tea at Mount Everest is very difficult. Really halfway. I should be at the summit for tea time. Ah, the top of the world. I claim this mountain, but how? Do you know what? I'm gasping for a cup of tea. Get your teas here. Boiling tea, boiling tea, absolutely delicious tea. How boiling. convenient. Would you like one, sir? I'd love a cup of tea, please, madam. Are. Thank you very much indeed. My God. It's freezing cold. But it was boiling. Be off with you, woman. Go on, get out of here. Coffee's like this. Ah! Sorry. So the, the water was boiling, but the tea's cold. But why? Well, the answer is the air pressure up the top of Mount Everest. Now, incredible as it seems, we're not actually up at Mount Everest, still in the house studio, where the air pressure is quite normal. But I can recreate the low air pressure up the top of Mount Everest using this equipment here, this bell jar. Now, in this flask, I've got some water. It's warm, not hot, just warm. The reason why that balloon is there, you will see in a moment. And that bit on the top there will be my tea automatic dispensing system. Now then, all I have to do is make an airtight seal here and start lowering the air pressure in the bell jar by pumping the air out. Watch the balloon. It expands because the air pressure inside the jar is getting lower and hopefully should tip that tea into the water in the flask which is actually starting to boil. Now, how come it's boiling? Because you saw me put my finger in it just a second ago. How come it's boiling? Well, I'll show you. The answer is that the higher you get away from sea level, the lower the air pressure, and the lower the air pressure, the lower the temperature water boils at. In fact, up Mount Everest, water boils at only 70 degrees centigrade. So how can you have a hot cup of tea at Mount Everest? Well, you can't. But you could leave just after tea time. How did a football match start a war? Carol, I need your help, please. Would oh, you put yes. that moustache on, please? 
front ah, of us. Ah, Gareth, there you are. Welcome back. Put that on, please. <laughs> and I'll need one of these. <laughs> no, 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 Fred, you can't use rattles anymore. Now you can't, but for this particular how, we're going to go back more than 20 years to the 8th of June, 1969. The place... Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras in South America. Honduras are playing their next door neighbours and great rivals, El Salvador, in a qualifying match in the 1970 World Cup. For this demonstration, Carol, you are El Salvador, you are playing in blue. Gareth, you yeah. are Honduras, you are playing in white. Honduras, but this Honduras, match comes at a very Honduras, tense time because there have been political problems between these two countries, border disputes and the like. Suddenly, a Honduran striker, <gasps> Gareth, finds himself no! in front of the El Salvador no! goal and... Goal! No! Oh, Honduran no! wave. Hola! Honduras win it. Now we move on one week, this time to San Salvador, the capital of El Salvador. It's the return match. Again, it's goalless, it's very tense, when suddenly Carol, oh. one of the El Salvador strikers, finds himself oh, in front of the Honduras no! goal and... No! Goal! Oh, OK, no! El Salvador wave. So the two teams are level. They have to go to Mexico City, the capital of Mexico, a couple of weeks later for the deciding game. Very, very tense. Tremendous tension. It's two all after 90 minutes. We're in extra time. And... Oh, yes! Oh, Goal! Oh, oh, El Salvador win it. We're in Mexico City. Mexican wave, oh, Gareth. Mexican wave, right. Here we go. Yeah. But the tension was all too much because just a few days later, war broke out between these two great rivals. It only lasted for three days. There were thousands of casualties. Most of the Honduran Air Force was wiped out oh. and they called it the Football War. Who won the war? Well, El Salvador won the war, but they didn't win the World Cup because in the first round proper, these were their results. Here we go. Mexico 2, El Salvador nil. Soviet Union, two, El Salvador, nil. Belgium, three, El Salvador, nil. Oh. So they never won the World Cup, and they never scored a goal. But that's how a football match started a war. Now, how far can a frog jump? Well, on average, a frog can jump 12 times the length of his body. So if a frog was this long, that frog could jump all the way up to my shoulder, which is impressive. What about champion frogs? Well, here I have a champion frog, the American bullfrog. Freddy, the champion American bullfrog. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> who held the world record until he was beaten by our friend here, the South African sharp-nosed frog. Jones the jump. Jones the jump. But <laughs> how far could they jump? Well, when a frog bids for a title record, what he has to do is take three hops and then they take the average of those. Now, the American bullfrog managed in three jumps to cover an enormous six metres, giving him an average of two metres per jump. But what about the South African sharp-nosed frog? Well, he went much, much further. He covered a fantastic ten metres, which gave him an average of three and a third metres per hop. And if a kangaroo had the same jumping power of a frog, that means he would be able to jump in one bound the complete length of the Wembley football pitch. So how do frogs manage to do that? Well, I thought to explain, I'd just bring out a couple of devices from the Vorderman Corporation. And uh, frogs manage to do it because they use the enormously powerful muscles they have in their back legs. And here you can see the frog with the back legs and um, an elastic band uh, to show uh, how they store energy. And what they do is they push their back legs onto the ground, storing up this energy, a bit like compressing a spring. And then in one bound, they release it and jump these enormous lengths. And so that is how a frog can jump. And how far can he jump? Well, 12 times the length of his body on average. But a champion can go up to 60 times the length of his body. That's how. How um, did one man help us all to read? Well, until the early 15th century, books were handwritten, beautiful, ornate designs like this, which actually took a long time to do and made books very, very expensive. There had been experiments in printing books rather than handwriting them. In fact, early on, the first letter on a page, this ornate letter, was sometimes carved backwards into wood, and then you print it up like this. 
Good. It worked, kind of, except that the um, ink would rot the wood and you'd have to throw away your type. No good. So along came a chap called Johannes Gutenberg. Clever fella. He decided not to work in wood, but he actually worked in clay. What he did was carve out the whole page in clay and then apply molten lead. I'm not using molten lead, obviously. Put the molten lead over the mould and eventually it would cool, harden, and then you could lift your type off the mould and hopefully you should have the words that you wanted printing. Now, the clever thing about what this was, you didn't have to think backwards. The uh, molten lead did that for you. Then, what you did, hang on, I'll do this very carefully because I don't want the spilling everywhere. Then what he did was apply ink like so. Take the page that you want to print onto, lay it over your type like this. And I should have recreated what Gutenberg did. And that is a sort of a printed page. Not very good there. Then what you'd have to do is go about carving out the next page that you wanted to print. Oh, that would take ages. Gutenberg got fed up of doing this and had a smart idea. Hang on a minute, he says. Now that I've printed the page I want, why don't I chop out the letters that I've used uh -huh, and um, um, reuse them to print up the words for the next page? For instance, the word Ben made up from beginning there. Gutenberg had invented movable type, letters that could be reused. He built a workshop and in 1455, Gutenberg published the very famous Gutenberg Bible, a beautiful piece of work. But how did he help us all to read? Well, in inventing movable type, Gutenberg reduced the cost of printing books. So instead of just being the wealthy people who could afford to read books, Ordinary people like yourself, Fred, and Carol, and myself could buy books, and that's how we all learned how to read. Lovely. How can you whisk it away? Whisk what? Where? Whisk it away. Where? What do you mean? How can you whisk away a tablecloth, leaving behind, still in place, all the glasses, the cups, the plates? Fred, you Fred, could you never do that. Never. No, not no. yet I can't, but I know a man who can. Matt Ricardo, world champion whisker, show us how to whisk this tablecloth from beneath all this stuff and all this goodies on it without damaging anything. I'll certainly try, Fred. Tremendous concentration. Very tense moment here. Audience very quiet. Can he do it? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, ah. sir. Well done. Thank you very much. How does it work? Well, it's, it's an inertia thing, Fred. Um, the cloth's very light, very thin. The objects are very heavy. If you pull it quick enough, they stay there. Obviously, if you're learning how to do this, you don't use your mum's best crockery. Not a good move. How would you start? With a small miniature version of the very same cloth, or even a handkerchief. A large handkerchief. And a, a very heavy object. Non-breakable object. And you go at it. Tremendous a concentration. Nice quick level. And there we are. You see, natural. dexterity is the name of the game. Thank you, Perfect. good sir. Anytime. Let's call in a couple of bumbling amateurs. Do you ah, reckon we can there do you this? Are. <laughs> <laughs> Start. You're very good with that Not can, bad. Aren't you? Start good. in a small way, Carol. A very small. What with this? Yes. Go on, Carol. Nothing to it. Tablecloth okay, level with the table. Yeah. Hands level with the two yeah. main objects, the two yeah. cups. Keep it all straight. Okay. Go on, Concentration Carol. and a very quick whisk. Okay. Three, two, two one. one. Very, yeah. very good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Not bad for a beginner. Right, level with Gareth, the table. Level with yep, the table. Right. Hands level with the two cups. And if you a very determined right. yep. whisk. Very good. Noisy. Yes. But yeah. of course, the tables are quite small. I mean, anybody can really do that with a bit of concentration. You're not going to do this. This is no. an international whisking no. glass no. table. No, are you ready? No. Go on, Fred. Go on, Fred. Give me a three, no. a two, or one. Okay. Three, two, two one. one. Yes. <laughs> Well, you're sacked. <laughs> well, that's how you whisk it away, or don't, as the case may be, and that's, that's how for now. now. No, I don't need jelly.